Hey traders, David Frost, my strategic forecaster here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Tuesday, May 5, 2020. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. There's stuff today. There's certainly a lot of stuff. We get to look at the market from a few different angles today. We're going to get to pull back the curtain on a couple of different types of trades. We're going to go over some trade mechanics. This one is specifically for Inside the Numbers members. In addition to that, we're going to get to take a look at something we discuss all the time. We're going to look at it, something that happened basically in real time. It just took place this afternoon. It's fresh. It happened. We get to review exactly what, why, and where it happened. How about the daily chart? What jumps off the page at you? What jumps off the page at me? They may be two different things. What jumps off the page at me is the type of candle that it is. It looks like one of those, what I like to call, pseudo-doji candles. That's a doji candle that's not really a doji candle. It's almost a doji candle. Is that an illusion or did that actually take place today? Here's a picture of the SPX, which is the cash index. You have a different candle. Here, you basically have a gap and crap. Now, it's not a full alt failure, full tilt gap and crap, but it is and qualifies for a gap and crap. The market gapped up. It sold off, finished at the lows. Therefore, that is by definition a gap and crap. So what's this candle all about? What do we make of that? Well, it's more shenanigans. Remember the shenanigans from the other day? It was the long tail candle that went all the way up to the gap. Guess what? It finally disappeared, and guess what? Now a new one emerged. This one is a lot shorter than the last one, but nevertheless, what does it do? It goes down to the gap below. So they never filled the gap at 290.48 today, the high of day, and let's just move this over so we can clearly see, high of day was 289.25. So there's a couple of things going on. And by the way, why are there all those lines on the chart? It seems like a mess. Guess what? We'll get to that later. There's always a method to the madness. There's a reason why those lines are on my chart. For now, we can even start with the lower line, which is 283.57. What does that represent? It represents the gap left open from yesterday's close. What was low of day? 283.71. So they did not fill the gap. Well, they didn't fill the gap on a daily basis, even with the shenanigans candle. I'm just saying it doesn't stretch down to the gap. What I was really saying was they didn't fill the gap, but then I caught myself, tried to cover it up, and just blow right past. But the honest engine in me figured I would come clean. I just forgot at the time it was a shenanigans candle. So the shenanigans candle doesn't stretch all the way to the daily gap. But guess what? Where did the shenanigans candle go? It went to 283.71. Guess what? If you take a look at the 15-minute gap, guess what? 283.71, opening print of this candle. Fills the gap on a 15-minute candle on the phony or shenanigans print. What's the meaning of that? Why did I just show you that? There's always a method to the madness. I showed you this to bring up a point. You see me look at a variety of charts all the time. I look at a 240-minute chart, a 120, an hourly, a 15, a 10, sometimes even a 5, sometimes a 30, and sometimes stuff in between. Why is that? Every chart has a purpose. The purpose isn't always the same every time. The market's always doing something. If you can identify which chart it's doing the thing right now, what's it trying to accomplish on which chart, you can generally see what the market's actually doing, what it's going to find resistance or support at, not every time, but a lot of the times. And then what do we know from there? We know that once the market gets to a destination, it does one of two things, hangs around for a cup of coffee or gets in its car, turns around, and goes back in the other way. How do we package that one up? That one's packaged as a trade. So the point I wanted to make by showing you the 15-minute chart is I went through a variety of charts to find what made sense where that number 283.71 
where it came from. Remember, here it is on the daily chart. It's a shenanigans print. The low is 283.71. And then I went to one of the intraday charts. It wasn't the first one, but I found where it went to. I found why it was important on which chart. Every time you find something like that, are you going to be able to use that information to your advantage every single time? No, of course not. But if you get in the habit of doing that, you'll start to see what you uncover. You'll be astounded at what you'll uncover. You'll start to see numbers repeat in different manners. Once you do that, once you see that occur, then you know the highest probability that that number is in fact important. And guess what? Once you gain the confidence that what you're doing actually works, you begin to place those trades. And when you place those trades with high confidence, guess what? You stay in the trade longer. Guess what? You squeeze more out of the trade. Why? Because you have confidence that your numbers are right. <clears throat> how does this all begin? It all begins by understanding how the market works. Where do you do that? You do that by taking the lazy e-mini trader course because that is, in fact, the foundation of how the market works. Sorry about the commercial. I couldn't help myself. Other than the shenanigans print, what else jumps off the chart? It's the close. Always the close. Where did the market close today? 286. Why is 286 important? Inside the numbers members are familiar with 286. Let's get reacquainted with 286. Where is it on the chart? It's right here. The high of this candle is 286.04. We're rounding for the purposes of four cents. It's close enough. The blue line is 286. I'm sorry about all the lines. We'll get this cleaned up in a moment. Plus, it'll all make sense in a moment. And by the way, we don't need this anymore. Now you already know what that is. But why is 286 important? Okay, so the market gaps down and the high of day, the high of the first candle of the day, in this case, hourly chart, but the high of day was 286.04. Now, I'm not telling you that's important. It's the market telling you that that price is important. It was the high of day. The market didn't get any higher. We're using it because also it's right around a nice fat round number, a round number, 286. It's a round number. So that coupled with the fact that it was high of day when the market gapped down to that area, we're going to say that level is important. Now, this is before it occurred today. We're saying this level is important, this price area, before price reached there at the end of the day. How do you know that? Because I've talked about it before. And how else do we know that? Because I beat it to death inside the numbers. But the question is, why is it important? What the hell can I learn from this is really the question. Well, here we go. Here's the way I have to and do look at the market. Because of that area, because I said that area is important because of the reason. It was the high of day. Therefore, I know that the market's going to have to get through that to go higher it's not going to be easy one of two ways that the market's going to get through there it's either going to bust through by either a very powerful move consolidating under it in like a bull flag kind of formation or it's going to gap above it which is actually the easiest thing it can do the fact that the market gapped above it today a tells us another thing it's reinforcement that that area is important because the market gapped above it. Look what the low of day was in the first candle. Not low of day, but the low of the first candle. The low was 286.26. Not right on the number, but they stayed above 286. So right there, it's a hint. We know it's a round number at 286. They didn't come even down to test it. They just took off to the upside. But I know in my mind they gapped above it. You know where I'm going with this. What does that also tell me about 286? It's a breakout area. What else does that tell me? It tells me that because markets like to come back and test former breakout and former breakdown areas, that likely we would see 286 again. You guessed it. Where are you going to see it? Right here inside the numbers. Here's the pre-market notes. We're going to run through this stuff and you're going to see right out of the chute and this is before the market open. We're already talking about 286. Remember that one. That was from yesterday. Now, unfortunately, when we get these kind of gap ups, gaps and goes, that kind of opening market, 
many times it takes away a lot of the opportunity. It takes away a lot of the opportunity for volatility in the index itself across all the indexes for the most part. And it also takes a lot of the opportunity away for stocks on the move because there really aren't a lot of stocks on the move. When the market is opening up big, everything tends to be a rising tide lifts all boats scenario. However, we're going to take a look at stocks on the move anyway because there's a couple of takeaways. We're going to learn two things from two different charts, EURN and WRK. You'll see here, WRK says jump target. That's the entry hit column on the right-hand side, second from the right. We'll go over that chart. I want everybody to understand exactly what that means and why it's important to me. All right, let's get back to the commentary. When the market's gapping up, the best thing we can do is give solid resistance areas, solid support areas, and identify the fact that the market is basically taking off. What we don't want to do is chase the market. You can start and stop the video anytime you like. I urge you to read the commentary, then go back to the charts and see what the market was doing after the commentary was posted. Today was one of those days where really the only thing we had on the board was either the market was going to run up and fill a gap up above. Maybe there was an opportunity to hop on board if they had some kind of a late day drop them slash pull the rug out type of operation, which they did do. They just didn't have the pop them thing that follows. And what I mean by that, and you'll see it posted here later, is a lot of times on one of these floater days, we see the market have what I like to call a jam session into the close. They jam the market up out of nowhere by 10, 15 S&P handles or some number out of nowhere. It just happens. A lot of times they drop them before they pop them. So we started talking about that this afternoon as a potential on the board. But they had to stay above a certain number. And guess what? When they dropped them, they first tried to stay above a certain number, which was in fact, and there it is, near the top of the page, 287.50. If they stayed above 287.50, then they were likely good and we could count on or potentially see a pop into the closing bell. However, getting below 287.50 would take that off the table and do what? It would bring into view 286. There's the same 286 that was in fact a former breakout area. Guess what? They're going to come back down to eventually test a former breakout area. Now we talk about this stuff each and every night, if not every night, almost maybe two, three days a week at minimum. And there's a reason for that because the market does it all the time, whether you're looking at a stock, a commodity, a five minute chart, a 15 minute chart, an hourly chart, a daily chart. And what does the daily chart apply to? Hourly, daily, and weekly charts apply to those traders that don't want to sit there in front of the computer all day. They don't want to day trade. They want to take a position. They want to go about their business, maybe go back to work or go back to retirement, go back to golf, go back to doing whatever they're doing. And then when the trade works out, they want to be out of the trade. But if it takes two days, three days, two hours, five days, they're okay with that. Guess what? That's okay too. Why? Because in the course, Lazy E-Mini Trader, what you learn is that all charts act and react the same way. So if I'm showing you something on an hourly chart, the same concept applies on daily, weekly, monthly charts. It doesn't make any difference. Now, if you've been around here for a long time, you know that. If you haven't, then you don't. Now you do. By the way, let's wrap up the S&P because it's pretty simple. I don't like them being back below 286. Opening the day tomorrow below 286 is a bad deal. It's a bad deal for the bulls. It's a good deal for the bears. That's a failure. They tried to get above. They broke out and then they failed. They got back inside the breakout area. That's a failure that will likely mean lower prices than just 286. They open above 286 tomorrow. Then they're in the same position as if they gapped above 286, came back down to test it, and the market never closed. Now let's go learn something else. So one of the two stocks on the board that hit their price objective today was EURN. And what you'll see were two numbers, 1062 and 1027. What we do when we see two numbers like that that are relatively close together on the board is 
If I'm going to buy, for example, let's just use the hypothetical example. I'm going to buy 2,000 shares of EURN. I'm going to buy 1,000 shares at the first price and 1,000 shares at the second price, making my average price directly in the middle. Today, that price is 1045. Now, a couple of things on this. Why does that happen? Why are there two prices on the board? When I do the analysis, I can make the case, when I do the analysis, if I can make the case for the market to have a destination at price A, but also at price B, and equally justified, I put them both on the board, and I'm happy to buy both. I'll take my average in the middle. If I put the top one on and not the bottom one, and it blows through all the way to the bottom one, traders get nervous. If I only put the bottom one and it stops at the top one, trying to be conservative, we don't get into the trade. But you'll see what happened. The first price really wasn't the destination today. It was the second price. What was low of day, or at least low of the morning session before it broke down later on, but you certainly got the reaction in the other direction off of what? The low in this candle at 9.45 a.m. was 10.27. How do you do that? We do it all the time. You see it in these videos day after day after day. Not necessarily always to the penny, but generally speaking, we're pretty good. So now you're in the trade, or I'm in the trade with an average price of 10.45. I have to be aware of a couple of things. The destination was 1027, so that's where the bounce higher or rocket ride or whatever it's going to be is coming from. Not my average price, but where it's actually coming from. So me knowing what I know and then me or in my head telling you what I'm thinking because I think it's valuable information. When this happens and I see the stock bounce right back to what would have been the first entry price, I still believe that price is important. Just today, the stock didn't think it was important. Today, it wasn't the destination. But in my heart of hearts, I know it's a real number. When I see that, I have no choice but to begin taking exits or all or some at or around or above that price, knowing that that price is probably important. So here we go. Take a thousand shares off. I have a thousand shares left, but I'm not willing to let the stock go south of my entry at 1045. Worst case scenario, if your exit was somewhere in the vicinity of 1062, 1060, 1064, 65, whatever it was, under this hypothetical example, that was a pretty much real example, and then you were stubborn, but doing the right thing, treating it as a business, not letting the second half, the, th the remaining thousand shares go south. So the exit is taken at 1046, right? Because I don't want to take it at break even. I want to cover the cost. So in this example, what does a trade like this net me 2,000 shares? About 170 bucks. Not a big trade. Guess what? It's a base hit. Maybe it's a bunt for base hit, but it's a base hit. So what? Could I have taken five, 10,000 shares? Yeah, but you know why I didn't? And I'm going to give you the real answer. When I've never heard of the stock before, I'm not taking five or 10,000 shares. I don't know it from Adam. If this was Ford, I would have felt comfortable taking five, 10,000 shares. It's not. I don't know who this is. I'm taking 2,000 shares, minimizing my risk. It's part and parcel to treating this as a business. The same $170 could have easily turned into 2,000. You don't know that. You don't know that until it's over. By the way, nothing at all wrong with 170 bucks. It's a lot of money. It's 170 more than I had before the trade. Now, here's another one. We're going to learn something here. There were two numbers on the board for WRK, Westrock, 2860, 2832. What you also saw on the board was jump target. This was a no trade. Why was it a no trade? The opening print today happened to be 2829, below the low number of 2832. Am I taking this trade? No. Why? It opened below the number. This is in the notes where it says must read under stocks on the move. The main reason is I know my numbers are important. There's no accidents or coincidences. The stock opened three pennies below my number after hovering above the number all morning long. I'm not taking that trade. I want no part of that. 
That is absolutely the makings of a rope dope Remember what we just went over, which we go over all the time. The gap up or gap down scenario. They gap above an important number. They gap above a breakout area. They gap below something important. It's the easier way to do it. To me, if they're gapping below this right at the last moment, this isn't the last stop on the train. It was the first stop on the train. That's why when you see jump target, it's a no trade. Now, sometimes we'll see jump target on the first price and the second price is far away. That doesn't count. You jump the last one on the board, it's a total no trade. Wrap up the S&P right here. And what's interesting enough is if you look at the top, the market's still trading in the after hours. 286.06, offer 286.08. You see 286 is, in fact, important, at least from where I sit. By the way, here was that 287.50. You see when the market came all the way back down, it stopped short of 287.50, making a low of 287.58. Bounced up. It had a nice rally off that. Doesn't look like much on this chart, but it was. And then they cut through it like a hot knife through butter. Heading to where? And once they got below that, we knew the next number. It was in the notes. If you read the notes, if they got below there, the destination was 286. You have to know your numbers. What's going on down in Camp IWM? Interestingly enough, we had the same gap in crap. And I'll tell you this, the IWM was actually leading all day long from a percentage basis against the SPY. At the end of the day, the SPY finishes up leading against the IWM. Of note, puzzle piece on the table. By the way, short hop back to the SPY. Is there anything wrong here? Just because we had a gap in crap, don't forget the market was still up. I neglected to really reinforce that. We can't lose sight of that. The S&P was still up about 1% today, a little short of that, but about 1%. Right now, until we lose yesterday's low, the market is okay shape. What's above that? The gap. Call it 283.50 for argument's sake. You don't want to start trading below that on an hourly closing basis. That'll be some trouble for the bulls, happy for the bears. Same routine with the IWM. If they come down, maybe they come down to fill the gap. Maybe they run a test of the moving averages. But until and unless they get below the moving averages and also below yesterday's low, then they're okay shape. All that said, same routine for the IWM. Closing hourly below that gap wouldn't be good for the bulls. It would be better for the bears. What gap? The one at 125.68 right here. Closing price 125.68. Ah, the canary in the coal mine. Up day today, but look what they couldn't do. Forget about what they did do. Let's think about what they couldn't do. They couldn't recapture the convergence of the 20 and 50 period moving average. They tried and failed. Certainly that's a puzzle piece and it's absolutely on the table. The transports is my favorite canary in the coal mine, second favorite market leading indicator. Now, both sides of the tape, both sides of the plate, meaning being the umpire, they're still working on higher lows, right? Now, if that becomes different, then it's different, and then something different is going on. Right now, they're still working on higher lows, so right now they can still recapture these moving averages right here and go higher. But if they can't recapture the moving averages, what's the likelihood that they're going to maintain this last higher low? It's not likely at all. Hashtag reading the tape. What about the cues? Totally different scenario for the cues. Yeah, we had a gap in crap, but what did they do? They filled a gap and backed off. It was also at a double top, albeit from the other day, still a double top. So is anything wrong with that? Or is that garden variety market behavior? Yeah, it's garden variety market behavior. What if I showed you this chart? It's the ES daily chart. This is the futures contract. S&P E-mini futures. This is a breakdown candle here from the 1st of May. So what if I explain things like this? Today, they climbed up the breakdown candle like they normally do to test the top of a breakdown candle high. In fact, today, they got above the top of the breakdown candle, but at the end of the day, they reversed back down and finished below the breakdown candle high. Is that normal garden variety market behavior? Yeah, pretty much. All depends on your perspective without bias. And oh, by the way, in that same analysis, they came up short of the gap. Which gap are we talking about? 
the gap here. Closing price happens to be 2902.50, just north of a big fat round number of 2900 tends to be magnetic to price. So if they were to keep going today, they were likely to fill the gap, which is also magnetic, get to the big fat round number, but they didn't. They reversed. They missed the gap, so that could be a sign of weakness. That's in the bear camp. So on one hand, we have something in the bear camp on the bear side of the ledger. On the other hand, we have something that the market did, which is very garden variety. With both of those things as stated, is it conclusive or inconclusive? And oh, by the way, let's throw in the fact that they're sitting on 286, which is important. Why? It was a breakout area. If they give it up, it's a failure. If it holds, they came back to test a former breakout area, and then they go back in the other direction. We see it all the time. So here you have a complete trip inside my head. XLF, what is it telling us? Very similar to the story from the transportation department. Below those moving averages, in fact, Weaker than the transportation department, they couldn't even get to the 50 or above the 50 period moving average, failed anyway. So you just look at this from the outside looking in and say, oh, XLF was down 7 cents today. I look at this chart and I see something entirely different than 7 cents. It's not easy being me. Let's reiterate, we know the story. Without the financials, the market's not going to get very far in either direction. So guess what? If the financials are falling likely drag the market along with it or be dragged down with the market. Either way, tomato, tomato, doesn't make any difference. Smash Mouth, what do I see on this chart? And I'll tell you something did jump off the page on this chart. Not only the gap in crap, but again, it's the missing of the gap. So here's the gap. Closing price, 133.73. High today wasn't even close. 132.83. They missed it by about a buck. How do you miss the gap by that much? and fail. Either it's really, really weak, it's a colossal miss, and they're going down, or it's a rope-a-dope. And we know from all the other stuff, it's just not conclusive yet, but this is the way I analyze stuff. You're inside my head. It's everything I've got. Now, maybe it's not everything I've got, but it's all I'm willing to share today. If I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you. You're all important, and without you, these videos are not possible. Here's where I pull the ripcord because it's everything I wanted to and intended to discuss today. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.